Hey, everybody. Thanks for downloading this episode of The Agile Wire. Jeff and I will be at the Fall Experiment on October 4th and 5th to record, present, and run a workshop. So if you're planning on attending, definitely swing by and say hi. Also, the Agile Online Summit is coming up. You can check it out at agileonlinesummit.com. In this episode, we got to record with Jim Sammons, a professional scrum trainer with scrum.org, a believer in people and an all-around great guy. We dive into spikes, the coaching stance, diversity in Agile, and what it means. We've got all the show notes up on the site as well. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky. And we're recording. All right, Mr. Jeff boobles not me you go ahead and kick this off man all right so we got jim sammons on the podcast tonight uh jim we were recently at the professional scrum with kanban course and we were having dinner with a bunch of psts um and we were talking about a bunch of different things and one of the things that came up was you have this blog that you've been dying to post uh but you're kind of wondering how the community is going to take it and about spikes and so you wanted to kind of dive into that and maybe have a conversation around it so let's let's jump into it so what what it's your opinion on spikes well i i like them as a practice i mean i i know that you know with almost anything in this community uh no matter if, if you take an opinion, if you take a firm stance on anything, there's always a whole bunch of people that'll tell you why you're wrong and and shoot holes at you. And it, and it sometimes makes me shy away from taking a stance. But I like spikes. But I also agree they're routinely misused. And uh, I'm probably going to post it. You know, I, I, I'm not going to shy away from posting it. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to it, but I, I like spikes. I think they're a really good technique for teams and when used correctly, they're good. Uh, when abused, they're bad, just like most things. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit and well, not necessarily unpack, but let's be more specific. So when we say spikes, what do you mean by that? So my simple definition of a spike is a time box for learning. And it's uh, just an opportunity for the team to say, we need to go do some investigation or we need to go research something or we need to go learn something. Not learning as in going to a class or, or going to a training class, but uh, maybe they need to go pick a new uh, automated testing framework. Maybe they need to go research options A, B, and C and come back to the group or come back to an architect and say, after you know some investigation, this is the way we think we should go. Um, or maybe they get a new defect and they have no idea what's going on, and they say, "Look, we want to like be very conscious about this, very specific. So we want to create a spike, and we want to go off and we want to research stuff, and then come back and present it back to present our findings back to the team, the product owner, designers, whoever." Uh, and when used like that, that's what I like. What do you, how would you guys define a spike if somebody were to ask you? So I normally define a spike as an experiment. So it's a time boxed experiment that we're going to run. We're going to pick, um, are we going to use Angular 2 or are we going to use React? And we're going to spend eight hours. Um, we're going to create up a hello world with some basic functionality um, in those eight hours. And we're going to test some things that we need to test. And then we're going to make a decision at the end of that eight hours, uh, whether we're going forward with one thing or the other. And I'm just making up eight hours. It could be 16 or 20 or whatever you want the time box to be, but you set some kind of time frame and you run that type of experiment eternally. Now, I agree with you, like learning should be a first class citizen. It is a first class citizen. But I think that everything in moderation, right? In Scrum, we want to do a little bit of everything. And if you had a whole entire sprint full of spikes, I would say that you're kind of missing the point. Like then people would say it's a learning sprint. And anytime we put the word before or after anything word, bef any word before or after the word spike, I think that's when it becomes an anti-pattern um, because you probably are just been neglecting that for too long. So yeah. th I, I think that's the fear that most people have with spikes is that they can get misused and a lot of teams do misuse them and they bec become more of like an analysis phase um, instead of just like, hey, we're continuously learning and we're continuously delivering value at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I had a team that 
we were doing a voice project and nobody on the team had really done anything production quality with a voice application. So we knew that in the first sprint, we needed to deliver some value. So we needed to have an increment, but we, we had like six spikes in the first sprint and they were research the voice providers. And I didn't know this, but there's like 11 major voice uh, kind of ecosystems. And then there's different ways to test voice. Like, how do you test voice? And we had a bunch of senior developers on the team and, and that had done some really cool stuff, but they didn't know. So they wanted a spike to capture that effort to go and experiment with different uh, automated testing platforms for voice. But you, you mentioned something that was you know, that's key, I think, which is time box for an experiment. So I like to drive teams to have acceptance criteria for spikes. When, when this is over, what are we going to have? What are we going to know? Mm -hmm. And then they, re, they play that back to each other. And then they might decide, well, we still don't know enough. We know some things now. Let's go do something else. Or maybe we know enough to move forward with more value added activities. So I, I was actually jotting down notes as, as the two of you were, were going back and forth with this. So if, if we thought about like, what, what are the requirements that we would say, okay, yes, this is an acceptable spike. Um, I, I heard it has to have a time box. There has to be learning and or a defined output at the end of it. Like what is, what does success look like for this spike? Yeah, I'd agree. So if if we use those three now um somebody once told me the 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 best check of government is to think about how your opponents would use that against you so if if i was a team member um where where is the line that we would draw so that not everything on the backlog had an associated spike along with it so for instance, anytime we wanted to try something new, which in a complex do domain is gonna be pretty often, um, what would we be pushing back to say, if a team member said, well, we've got a time box, we've got some learning we wanna get from it, and we have a defined output, why can't we do this thing as a spike? Yeah, I, mean, I think that, that playing devil's advocate like that is great. And I think that spikes are overused and misused a lot. So I, you know, I don't think everything should have one. I, I, I think they should be rare, but when they're used, they should have some of those criteria you mentioned. Um, you guys encourage teams to think about invest when they're writing, you know, yep. PBIs. Yep. So when a team tells me they can't get to invest, one of the questions I ask is, could a spike help here? And whether it's about um, being unable to estimate something or having too much ambiguity. So one of the things I, I, I coach is a certain amount of unknowns is okay on, a, on, a, on any given product backlog item. We don't have to know everything, but is the risk versus what we don't know greater than the you know hit if you will to taking a time box and running an experiment like a spike and it's a discussion yeah so what i think i see happening is that you start getting down this road of spikes and then like jeff said too many every almost every pbi needs a spike before you do it and to me um, if that's happening, that's just refinement a lot of times because there's usually no experiment. Like they're missing one of those three elements. There's a time box. Uh, they want to learn something, but there's no experiment there. There's no choice of are we going to do A or B. It's just like I need to know more about this framework. I need to know more about this area of the code because I've never dived into it. And I would say, well, that's just a little bit of a more unknown. And so just you know, take that into consideration and maybe take on a little less work, but do the work and try to figure out the unknowns. And you, you might find it's less work than you think, and you might find it's more, but if you do all this analysis up front, you might end up just doing analysis to just like figure stuff out that you could have learned so much more if you just would have did it. So just, I think there's a lot of teams out there that are just, 
uh, they, they, they could get going sooner than what they, they think. And they're just, they want to have more of the unknowns, um, handled because they maybe been burned in the past. And I would just encourage them to like, accept the unknowns and embrace that and just push forward. So I think there's a balance. And I think that's what we're all, all three of us are saying is there is a balance. Um, another thing that I, I, I heard this actually from another PST, Summer Lawrence, um, she used this analogy I thought was really good on spikes. And she said, spikes, um, our experiments and refinement is data mining. So like if you're just looking for more information, that's like data, you're going out and just looking for it, that's that's refinement. Just count that as refinement. But if you actually need to make a choice between something, then that's a spike. So I, I think that's a pretty decent guideline for teams to use as well. Yeah, I like that. I was trying to, sorry, if you saw me looking aside, I was trying to find a quote from... Uh, Larman's class. And it's something to the effect of like documentation and, and architecture designs don't crash or something, something to that. Uh, but basically just to, the spirit of what the quote is after is you can do all the upfront and experimenting. Well, maybe not experimenting, but the design, it's not until you actually go and actually and start implementing that you find out whether it's, it's truly going to work or not. And so thinking about those, those three, items again, time box, learning, and defined output, I'd almost be thinking about it should be in your context as well. So like if if we just wanted to go off and prototype something in a standalone environment, um, maybe it is okay, but I think we would get more learning if we built that prototype into our environment, built it into our product or whatever it is that we would be working with because there just may be more complexity or unknowns that we would uncover through that operation incorporating it into our product versus trying to stand it up in an isolation or in a sandbox or something completely unrelated. So I'd also kind of throw that out as maybe an, another tertiary uh, consideration. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really like the idea of set-based design. I don't know if either of you guys have done any work with set-based design. But uh, it's a good technique to help teams ex run a bunch of little experiments to zero in on that quote unquote best um, decision. And sometimes it takes us seeing what doesn't work or seeing something to know what we do want. Uh, so that I, sounds I, like A-B testing. Is that similar or different? Yeah, I mean, set-based design is, you know, let's take some requirements, let's take some acceptance criteria if you want to use that, and say, what are some possible things that will satisfy that? And maybe it's A, B, C, and D would all satisfy those big requirements. So let's do a little bit of all four of those things. Then say, okay, now that we've seen them and we can touch them and look at them and click them or, or talk to it, now I, I need to add these new requirements, or now this other thing that I didn't value very much now is more important to me. So, okay, now let's refine a little bit, and maybe that eliminates choice D. So now let's go deeper on A, B, and C. Okay, now let's play that forward. Now let's uh, add in more and more robust design and capabilities, show the product owner, show stakeholders, and then we narrow down from A from A through D to A through C, and then maybe we select A. And I use Newland markers as a as a really simple way to talk about set based design. So if I wanted to go buy a marker and say I need to make clear legible marks on a sheet of paper, and that was my only requirement, I could go to any store and buy five, 10 different markers. But then as I start to add in more and more robust requirements, more specificity, my choice is narrow. So again, we're ta I'm talking about a very specific type of marker that, that not everybody knows about, but um, that's kind of what I like about set-based design is as we make things more robust, it leads us into a better decision instead of saying we have to know the absolute end state, the best decision for our designer architecture before we start. Yeah, that's really cool. I've actually never heard it called set-based design, but I use the analogy of um, 
quarantine and then combined with a lot of teams. It's like, let's quarantine and like split kind of into these separate teams that go in two different directions or multiple directions and then bring it back together at a certain point. Or maybe different teams do that in a scaling environment with like a technology decision or something like that. But let's experiment with these things, go in different directions and come back. The analogy that I like to use and I talk about this is like, hey, let's just say we needed to go to some geography point. We needed to go through, um, you know, Yellowstone National Park and we needed to get here. And you had a bunch of hikers. Well, if everybody goes together on one path and you get to this raging river you can't cross or to this cliff you just can't can't climb down, like we're stopped and you got to go all the way back. But what if you could go in multiple directions and you could teleport to the other one if you got stuck? And that's kind of what we're doing here is that you're kind of setting off in different direction, finding the easiest path and then moving everybody to that easier path once you figure out which one is actually easier. But you won't know until you get going. And so you just kind of get started and then go from there. So, yeah, I love that. That's great. Yeah. I heard a lot of similarities in just between that set-based design and also just thin slicing like features, for instance, making sure that you can get end-to-end functionality in order to get feedback on the areas that you thought you would improve and then validate that learning. And then that's the sections or the workflow components that you want to expand on. Is that similar or did I miss what you were getting at there? No, I, I, I mean, I, I think yes. And set based design is more about preserving our options as late in the process as we can. If we think mm. about that cone of uncertainty and, you know, again, I hate to say it, but safe scaled agile framework has some principles I really like. And one of them is assume variability, preserve options. We yeah. know things are going to change. So don't paint ourselves into a corner early on in the process, because I can't tell you how many times I've seen teams or product owners or, or leadership um, hate a decision that was made months before because they're like, well, you know, we have to do this because of a decision that was made, you know, by another group or made months ago. And they feel hamstrung. They feel painted into a corner uh, from their design. So set-based design is really by assuming that variability and giving ourselves the option to pivot as we need to. Mm -hmm. And understanding that we don't know what we want sometimes until we see what we don't want. (laughs) The analogy I use is when I bought my daughter her first car, I thought I knew exactly what type of car I wanted to buy for. But it wasn't until I went to the dealership and sat in a bunch of different cars and test drove a few more that I started to hone in on what was really important to me. And anybody who's bought a house or rented an apartment or bought a car or anything like that has probably experienced a little bit of that refinement in your brain that happens about, huh, what I thought I knew or what I thought I wanted isn't exactly what I want now. That's interesting. We were we were just talking with Julie a little while ago and she was talking about the work that Teresa Torres had put together and uh, kind of keeping yourself open to different options that are out there. Uh, she, she ran us through a cool little exercise, uh, both Jeff and I. We were kind of her guinea pigs before she was going out and giving this this uh, talk on it. It was, it was pretty neat. She's just saying, you know, say, um, I forget exactly the question, but it was basically say something you want in life. Um, and so we both, Jeff and I wrote it on a sticky note, put it in front of us. And she's like, okay, well, think about what would you have if once you had this thing, like what would that give you? Um, yeah. Put that up at the top and then great. Now think about that outcome that you achieved. Uh, what are other things that you could do that would give you that same outcome? And it was really just to separate us from the solution bias that we had already determined in our head like we already knew or we thought we knew this was the right way to achieve the outcome that we were going after but even just having that little exercise of putting the goal up at the level and then removing i i removed the sticky note below and it was like okay well what what are now all the different solutions that i could actually provide to get me to this outcome just to to help me step out of that bias that i already had thinking this was this was the one solution in order to achieve this outcome. I thought it was kind of just a, a very simple and very neat exercise to kind of widen your um, your viewpoint on that. Yeah. Have, have either of you guys had like a, a formal coaching session with a 
with like a professional coach? Um, I did once. Uh, it was about a year ago. We had a professional coach come in and uh, give us some coaching lessons on like how to be more per- like a pure coach, right? Like it was, yeah. had nothing to do with agile. Um, it was just about pure coaching. Um, I found it really interesting. I found a lot of similarities to things I was doing and then found a lot of ways that I could improve and reflected on it. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I really like peer coaching, but I also I see a lot of coaches out there that overuse that too, and that's like their only thing. And if that's your only tool in the toolkit, I think that sometimes um, people maybe get a negative imp- um, persona or nor- na- negative opinion yeah. of people that only use that peer coaching stance. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it feels so awkward. Yeah. Um, and and <laughs> you can. I, I have a friend who is also a trainer and he is in the very end stages of one of the highest level coaching certifications. So he needs to get so many hundreds of hours of documented coaching. And so he's giving me these professional coaching sessions for like a dollar. Um, and he was coaching me and it, it, I, I, I got really angry. Like I, I got super frustrated with the conversation, but he was doing some of those things you were just talking about, like positive reframing and negative reframing and yep. saying, you know, what would happen if, or why do you want that? And asking all these things and, oh my God, I got so <laughs> like worked up, but man, when it was over, I felt so good. And he led me to this place I mean, not not led, not led by the nose, but he asked a bunch of questions that where I led myself to this place. And I'm like, holy crap, did I did I just change my life? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he challenged a number of preconceived notions. It was it was it, it was shocking. Um, and then I told him, I'm like, OK, stop coaching me. And I'm like, end mm-hmm. the coaching, go back to being my friend. Now, let's talk. And and we did that. And it was it was interesting. Yeah, it's funny. Once you've like gone through that peer coaching and you understand the tactics and somebody's doing it to you, I've had to call people out on that, other friends that are coaches, be like, hey, enough of that. I don't want to be coached right now. I just want you to listen yeah. to me. <laughs> right, right. I just want to vent. <laughs> right. Sometimes I just want to like be pissed and vent and, you know, whine or whatever. But then other times you want coaching and it's good. Yeah, that's, I, I, I feel like, that's just a good life lesson, um, probably one that I need to, because I've heard it numerous times now, and I've yet to, to implement it. But it's basically, sometimes you do just want to bitch, and um, especially not that, okay, so I'm going to be careful how I phrase this. My wife and I have lots of conversations, and there are some times where she just wants me to listen, and I innately fall into a coaching or a solution person where it's like, okay, have you tried X? Have you tried Y? Or just trying to get her to think through things. And when that's not what you want, it's incredibly frustrating. Like when you just need to vent, get something off of your mind, you're not looking for a solution. You're just looking for an ear for somebody to listen to. Mm -hmm. Um, Like don't confuse those two because you may very uh, make that other person really frustrated or not help the situation. Yeah, there's a phrase that one of my fellow coaches at my current employer uses, which is called don't coast don't coach the ghost. I don't know if you've heard that, but no, uh-uh. talk a lot it. of so a, a lot of times when we're we're trying to help somebody and we're coaching, we're actually talking about a third person. So maybe, you know, Jeff Boobles, you're coming to me and you're venting about Molesky. And you and I are that talking through, right? It does. <laughs> and I say, well, he should do this, or have have you done this, or or you know, the conversation shifts, and we're actually both trying to coach somebody who's not there. Mm-hmm. So part of professional coaching is making sure you're very in the present with the the person you're you're actively coaching and helping them and but you sometimes have to help them with a a situation by proxy and if i tell you what you should do with jeff molesky then i'm i'm like in a roundabout way by proxy coaching a ghost if you will sure Mm -hmm. somebody who's not there 
Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we, we talk about that right a lot when I'm coaching scrum masters, like don't put yourself in the middle of a situation where you're talking to one person about another person, like yeah, you're going to be put in a bad situation, like bring those parties together, get them to talk, right? Like it's really just about getting people to talk. And if you need help facilitating that, then let's get everybody in a room and let's have a conversation. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense because that does happen. And, and sometimes it's very innocent and unintentional. It's just like, I wish this one person would just understand that. It's like, well, have you had the conversation with them? And usually the answer is no. You know, I haven't just tried to have that conversation yet with that person. And that's the nudge that people usually need. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. No, no, I was just going to say it's something you said earlier uh, made me smile because I'm lucky uh, that my sister is a software developer and my wife's a scrum master. And at times we've all learned, the three of us, Hey, I, I need my coach tonight. You know, I'll get that phone call because I'm kind of senior man, if you will. Sometimes my sister will be like, hey, I need a coach tonight or can I talk through something with you? And then sometimes we're sitting down to drinks and we're just, you know, playing a board game or having dinner or whatever. And she's like, I just want a bitch. I just want to complain. I, I don't want to be coached, uh, et cetera. So I, I just thought that was funny that with people you interact with a lot, you tend to kind of develop those those shortcuts and those triggers. But what were you going to say, Jeff? With the the announcement that came out from the business roundtable, um, did that make any waves for you? Tell me so, more. So the business roundtable, a uh, bunch of CEOs got together earlier this week, and um, they were like, they decided shareholder value is not the most important thing. And Jamie Dimon was one of the people that was in this. And yeah. they said it's stakeholder value. So stakeholders are employees, their uh, customers, their vendors, their everybody that has the environment. It's like everyone who has any kind of stake in the product that you're building. And uh, that's kind of what, you know, Steve Denning's been touting for a while. And there's kind of been this conflict back and forth. And, um, so it's just um, now they're kind of coming together saying that. And I just wonder if you, you know, if that's if you've seen any impact from that or any announcements have come from that since that announcement came out earlier this week. Uh, every time Jamie goes, you know, makes the news, it triggers a bunch of emails and and threads and chat and all that. Um, I love Jamie Diamond. I mean, I from from his his uh political leanings and his caring about people and, you know, wanting big organizations to do the right thing. And, um, some of the things he's been outspoken on, I find myself, I mean, I, I never agree with everybody a hundred percent of the time, but I'd say most of the time when he takes a stance, I'm like, yes, absolutely. Uh, want to high five the guy. Um, so I've seen the headlines. I haven't dug into the comments, uh, or or the specific, so I don't feel like I'm qualified to, to talk about it. But um, I mean, you you just gave me a good synopsis, so I, I guess the short answer is no. I haven't seen any direct impact from it, but I've seen things swirling uh, and, and just seen messages going around. Yeah, it was just it was kind of interesting. Not that I expected you know cats and dogs living together, you know, right after this announcement is made or anything, but you had mentioned. There, there's a, a number of pretty big hitters uh, in your organization as far as just in the Agile community, right? And so I was curious if um, there were any waves that were already starting to to feel the effects of that type of announcement or if it was just kind of business as usual right now. I was just curious. Yeah, I think so far it's business as usual. And there are some fairly recognizable names um, in the organization, Uh but I bet you there's a delay between like an event like that and then it filtering down and being put into practice and people changing their message and then that having an effect on teams and all that. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, we'll see. Sure. So it's interesting because like I think the debate is like, well, if you say stakeholder, are you saying what parts, you know, is it still shareholders are the biggest part, but these other things are things we need to consider or are customers the key, which is what, you know, Drucker and Denning would argue are like the most important thing. Like you put your customer first. That's what Amazon's done. That's what other companies have done. They've had a lot of success with that. Right. And so um, 
I don't know, there's been some articles written, you know, this week to, you know, some in Forbes and other places where they're like, hey, are we, is this just a smoke signal or is this really going to change behaviors or what is really important? Um, if they say, if everything's important, is nothing important, right? Like that's some of the conversations that's going on out there. So, I mean, time will tell, right? It's it's very early from that announcement earlier this week. Um, we'll see what happens. It'd be really cool if it does make a difference though. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a number of uh, – there's a portion of the population of employees, and the way that they start many conversations with you is by giving you two data points, how long they've been with the company and if they're a stockholder or not. And mm-hmm. I find that behavior telling, um, and I don't always care for it. <laughs> sure. In your organizations uh, or or organizations you've worked at recently, was that a a behavior that you saw where people put a high personal value on their longevity with the company and then also whether or not they were a stockholder? I've seen the, the long – um, longevity, I guess, at organizations like oh, I've been here thirty years. You're just a new kid yet. You've only been here a year. Like, right? You know that kind of thing. I have seen that. Um, the other thing I have seen, it's not so much. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think. Have I ever worked for a publicly traded company? I don't know if I have. I might not have. Um, and but I've seen a lot of insurance companies I'm working with, and it's not so much stakeholders as it is like this year's budget allows us to only do this or this um, short-term thinking only allows us to do these things. Like there's certain like constraints that the organization puts on that um, doesn't allow you to think about things like holistically and what would be best three, four, five years from now. And they're thinking what, like in the next quarter or next six months, what's the best thing that I need to do. And so I think it's not even stakeholder value. It's just short-term value That is the big um, problem, I think, in a lot of organizations, even if they're not publicly traded. It's just short-term value and not taking the long, the long-term approach. I'm not, I'm not trying to take a position that only newcomers have valid opinions and can push an organization forward, or that you know, uh, long-term employees are bad. It's, it's not a good or bad thing. I do find there to be a correlation between status quo thinking right like that'll never work here we've been there tried that you know that that comment came up in a meeting just the other day for me uh and basically what they told me was well of course we've tried that before and of course we've thought about that and we try we've tried that six different times that's never going to work we're not going to try it again um and it was interesting i was meeting with a middle manager the other day And he was explaining to me about his awesome new Scrum Masters. And he was ticking off this Scrum Master, that Scrum Master, this Scrum Master. And he he, he rattled off three of them. And I said, you know, Michael, there's something really interesting about all three of them. He said, what's that? I said, aren't they all very, very new to the company? And he said, yeah, I guess I never thought about that. He said, they've all just joined like in the last six months. And I said, what, what did, where did that, was there any commonalities about where they worked before? And he said, no, not really. They worked in different industries, different durations and all this. But part of the thing is that they, they brought is experience and success to the company. So they were pushing their teams, their, their leadership, their product owners, their organization forward by being able to say, I've done this elsewhere and it's been successful. Can we do this? So I I do think there's value in that. Um, But then you have to balance that with contextual knowledge and and longevity as well. Yeah, I think there's a balance. Like people talk about diversity a lot, but I think there's diversity of knowledge too, right? Like um, you could have a really diverse workforce, but if they've all worked at the same organization for 25 years – well, they're probably going to have very similar thoughts about things, you know. They've kind of simulated into some some kind of opinion on the world. Bringing people from the outside is going to be great to, like, spice that up and, and uh, bring different perspectives in, which is really what you're after. But 
now that said, you don't want all new opinions. You don't want all because there's there's certain things you learn from, you know, being at an organization for a long period of time. So I think like anything, everything in balance and everything in moderation, like there's you won't don't want to swing left or right too far. You want to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So I just want to jump in real quick. I know I'm going to get slammed by some people for this, but I, I wholeheartedly believe that if you're if you're not moving around every two to three years, you're probably becoming complacent to a certain degree. Um, I would say my my caveat to that is unless you're a consultant whose job it is to move around from organization to organization. But even in that, um, I feel like there's you're still probably getting entrenched into something uh, of the politics of the, the organization you're in. Um, I think the the experience that I was able to gain as a consultant can like you know, anywhere from like three to nine month gigs that I was on, like you just, you had to adapt. You had to learn how to talk with different people in different contexts. Um, and I just thought that was hugely beneficial for me, um, for my, my career goals or growth, I should say, not necessarily goals. Um, and just what I've seen at, at other organizations is, you know, th- Jeff, you were talking about that balance. I feel like too often it's, 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 heavily weighted on one side which is we want people that are here for a long time we don't have to retrain them on things but Mm -hmm. there there's a lot of baggage that that comes with that and then you wonder why so many people get institutionalized or that knowledge builds up in silos etc and even just moving around within bigger organizations i don't know if you're necessarily able to break free from that jim you're, you're making a face let me hear it Oh my God. So I, I've been in a number of organizations that have these mobility programs where not only do they encourage you to move through the company, they force it in many cases. And it leads to just a ton of, of negative uh, outcomes. Um, so like you said, all things in moderation, all things in balance, but imagine the the behaviors that come when you know that as a as a as a junior executive that you have 18 to 20 months in a in a role and then the company is going to want you if not force you to move to another part of that company and mm-hmm. from a from a security standpoint and from ha- and from growing well-rounded executives Many companies want their executives to bounce around the firm or bounce around the company and learn different things. But the problem is that is extremely disruptive when it creates this carousel of of planning and this carousel of vision and this carousel of values and things. And I've just found it to be extremely disruptive. Um, But I want to go back to something that uh, the other Jeff mentioned about uh, diversity, because uh, I have the the benefit of hearing Fareed Zakaria from CNN this year was the keynote at my daughter's college graduation. She graduated from Ohio State, and uh, Fareed Zakaria was um, the commencement speaker, and he talked about how never more than in our current climate are people being are people gravitating towards like minded people. So we see in urban areas, we see people gravitating to people who think like them. We see a greater um, propensity for people to live with, live near, bank with, uh, shop at places of people who think and look and sound just like them. And we see it in rural America, we see it in urban America and all this. And his talk was about how that is destroying democracy and how what we all need to do, and, and the analytics show us this online too, apparently, um, that on major social media platforms, people are seeking out people who think just like them, and they are in droves moving away from people who um, have the opposite opinion. Um, and we could talk about politics, but it, it, he, his point was it's not even just a political problem. It's just a human problem right now. I'm curious if you've seen that on teams, if you've seen that in the workplace, if you've seen that impact, you know, your work. I, I'm going to jump all over this because this is one of my favorite, favorite subjects. Awesome. So jump on. Uh, so, so, uh, another coach, Paula, shared a, a picture because she was big into to D&I. Um, 
just uh, the the picture that I'm referring to is the the diversity iceberg and how people often think of like skin color, race, gender, age, those kind of those uh, shallow type of diversity. Um, but then things like beliefs, work style, localization, division, skills, perspectives, talents, family status, like there's just this huge array of different things that we can think about with diversity. Um, but the thing I, I personally like to hit on is I like the phrase rising tides lifts all ships. And so setting people who are dis disenfranchised, disadvantaged, setting them up for success. That's, that's, these are all great things about diversity. But from a consumer perspective, from building better products perspective, we need diversity because without that, we, we, we have tunnel vision, we have tribalism, and we, ultimately we build shitty products because we don't have the diversity of thought the diversity of experiences that we want with our with our product teams with our delivery teams to build great products and from a, a purely consumer centric perspective um, that alone um, you know all the other goodness aside like if we were purely thinking about capital that alone is a great reason to have diversity with teams and by the way we get all of this other great stuff all the, the, the great stuff that I was talking about with raising, uh, rising tide, raising all ships, et cetera. Um, so I, I can't imagine anybody who would be against that. But I would agree with you, Jim, that I think that most people's um, natural approach is to say, I want to simulate and be around people like me because that's easiest and people don't like conflict and it's not going to challenge me. And so, like, I totally agree. Like, that's people's... Um, you know, natural approach to where they want to go. But if you want to build the best products, if you want to build things that um, that really innovate and are creative, you're going to need different opinions and different perspectives. And I think for me, it's more about um, experiences and perspectives. I like the diversity on um, cultures. I, I mean, it can be anything, um, but it's not it's not so much of a, and we have it a lot, right? And when we're building technical products, it's not a just a male and a female thing. It's not just a, um, you know, um, different ethnicities, things like that. It's it's so much more than that. And I think that's where people a lot of times leave it is at a very shallow level. And so I think it needs to take a couple steps further than that. Yeah, I, I think that there's a line between. <sighs> there, there's a line between forcing diversity and actively stepping away from it. And I think that's Fareed's point was people are actively on social media disconnecting from, stepping away from, unfriending, if you will, uh, unfollowing people with the opposite thinking. So if you only surround yourself with people who think like you, that's one thing. Um, that's a very dangerous thing in his opinion. Um, that might be... Uh, a lot more harmful than saying, well, I, I want to gravitate and spend time with people and spend time around people who think and who think like me, because that's like you said, it's easier and it might be more enjoyable, but I can't just shut my brain down. I can't shut my brain off to the fact that um, somebody might have a difference of opinion. Um, th this came up twice in my, in my recent career, like in the last few years with, with clients. One, I was working with a major public school company or public school, um, system, and we were working on a voice platform and there was, I was told by an administrator, there was over 300 different languages spoken in the school district. And uh, many of those were, were regional dialects of, of different major languages, but there was over 300 that just their K through 12 uh, students spoke. And if you think about building a technology-based product for parents to help children, how important is it that we would let data influence, you know, some of our, our backlog decisions? Um, you know, we, we couldn't only prioritize English. We couldn't even only prioritize Spanish. And then at a totally different company, totally different product, um, we, we were talking with the product group about the backlog and, and the roadmap. And I said, well, a huge portion of your customer base is in Texas. We know that large portions of Texas are Spanish speaking. There's this big Spanish language initiative on your backlog. Why is that so low? 
And the product owner's like, oh my God, I know, you know, I, I haven't really considered that. And that's a great point. And another person in the room had a very visceral response and is like, I, I'm not even going to repeat what they said, but it, it was pretty far out of bounds. And I mean, this was, you know, recently. And I was just shocked at at the kind of the lack of of inclusion uh, when we're building a technology product for a core service for human beings uh, and kind of just not taking that diversity into account. Have you guys ran into that? So not in in the room in the same way that I think you're you're talking to, um, but. So, so Jeff and I actually built a kind of a talk around this stuff that we're going to be given here in October. Um, but one of the things when this started, not necessarily hitting close to home, if you will, but one of the things that I really wanted to try and stretch myself on was forcing myself to listening to opposing views. So in general, I'm a pretty left-leaning individual. And um, because of that, you know, even it, what was interesting, you were talking about products and leading down. Just think about YouTube's recommended videos. Well, it's recommending videos that you've liked, that you've watched before, and it's just reinforcing the bubble that you're living in. So um, I, I started listening to the Ben Shapiro show. And if you're a, a pretty liberal individual, that's like vitriol to you. Um, and it was at first. It was it was real, real tough to listen to that guy talk and just blast um, Democrats left and right. But um, over time, I started, you know, shutting down the, the defenses and really trying to listen to the arguments that this guy was putting forward. And uh, it, it just forced me to introspect and say, why? Why do I believe these things um, come up with the right arguments and accept some of the the faults that, that that he was presenting, and so I thought that was a, a fun experiment for myself. And I'm hoping more people are doing that. More people are forcing themselves into uncomfortable situations that that are going to force themselves to confirm why it is they they actually believe these things and to start hearing points of view that are contradictory to their own. Yeah, it comes down to really just civil discourse, like being able to have conversations and not just being like. I'm left or right, or I'm this way or that way, and being like, well, let's hear why, and let's hear in this context why it makes sense, and let's have some real like conversations. And it's not like there's not such thing as a good or bad, or you know, there's not good and evil out there. It's just there are different people with different decisions. You know, like um, the analogy we like to use is like, hey, Microsoft and Apple, right? Like people might look at those two things and be like, oh, Apple's better than Microsoft or whatever. Like, you know, at least there's people out there that would say that, right? Or one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But if we showed you maybe two politicians, you might think one's better than the other, right? Like that gets really polarizing. You can laugh about Apple and Microsoft, but you don't maybe laugh about politics. And I know we're kind of getting the edge of, that's not really what we're here to talk about, but it still, it still um, dives into product development that you see those same exact things happening. And I think anytime you can have a conversation and argue on behalf of the other side of the story, when you have a very strong opinion about something, it really gives you a lot to think about and consider um, um, when you're, when you're diving into different, you know, design decisions, different uh, product decisions, different, um, features like you talked about like do we add spanish or not like why wouldn't we add that um and some people might have very different opinions on that and they might origin from you know their political background and, and is that what we want i don't know like those are all good things that you brought up right like it, it brings it to the front well, what happened here in wisconsin because of course we have this thing called midwest nice which you probably have too in ohio right like people don't yeah. want to have conflict and so they're just really nice and but those biases just get hidden behind a bunch of niceties and um so you as coaches we're trying to bring that stuff out a lot of times to say well why you know do we really believe these things why are we why are these behaviors happening um and then trying to service that and i think not not only is it just partly with the diversity but the lack of customer engagement and i mean it's funny to look back, but there was there was a point in time that not only did we care so little about our customers, but we called them idiots and wrote them books on how they should be using our products, like the Idiot's Guide to Windows 2000, for instance. Like that's how little we actually cared about our customers at one point in time. Oh, right. Like project management for dummies or 
or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, who wanted to be seen with one of those black and yellow books? Like, I'm not a <laughs> dummy. I just don't know this thing yet. Yep. I, I'm probably the only one on the call who's old enough to remember when the internet had yellow pages. And I mean, <laughs> I don't know if either of you guys remember that, but it was just, it was a badge of honor to be carrying around the internet yellow pages. It was from this guy, Harley Hahn, and it was a book, a big thick book. And I just equate that book to the the whole dummies line because they were really popular around the same time. And you would walk into a leader's office or a, or a manager's office, and you'd see sometimes a whole bookshelf of dummies books. So you'd see like Token Ring Networks for dummies, Cat5 or Ethernet for dummies, Windows for dummies. And it was, I don't know, just... You, Man, Token Ring. It's been <laughs> years since I've heard that phrase. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Many people that are listening to this probably have no idea what token ring is. Trust me, a token ring is not something you wear on your finger. No. So one one of the other things that you were that you were talking about earlier was uh, kind of um, org design stuff and um, the separation between career growth um, and delivery. What were what were you thinking on that? Well, it's again something that I've given a lot of thought to. I'm going to be doing a talk later this year about this. Um, about this role and it kind of you mentioned Craig Larman's uh, less class earlier and, and it, it kind of came front and center when I was in there which is if we have somebody who is incentivized or or focused on growing a human being's career or or creating this ideal or enhancing their work environment. And then we also ask that person to deliver at any cost. Um, something's going to win. Like when, when the rubber meets the road, something is going to win. And if they have to make a choice. So the question becomes, can one person be expected to balance those things equally at all times? Um, making the decision that's let, let's take take Jeff Bubbles. So take Jeff's career and him as a human being and um, all the things that go along with that. But then also, let's say you're Jeff's functional manager, and you also want him to deliver. Um, at what point do you care more about the individual or care more about delivery and and mm -hmm. understanding? the dichotomy that that puts people in to to have to choose what they prioritize at any given time so i what i'm seeing is a lot more organizations move to this matrix where we have people who care about our, us and our career and the fact that we bring our whole selves to work and then different people who focus on delivery and i'd love to hear your guys's thoughts on you know, and there's no rules here. Of course, there are people who can navigate those waters. But on average, would you say that it's very difficult for a manager to walk both of those lines at the same time? I I would. I think it's hard for them. Um, I was in a meeting. Yeah, this was a few months ago now. And somebody made the comment, well, like, we can't train all these scrum masters and agile coaches because we just train them and then they end up leaving. And I'm like, well, what happens if you don't train them and they stay? And they're like, oh yeah, good point. That would suck. And so, I mean, I think that there's always a balance. Like, again, we keep, we said this earlier in the podcast, like everything in moderation, you still have to deliver, but you also have to deliver value and learning. Like we were talking about before with the spikes Learning on a product is important. Also learning personally is, is important. And so you have to do a little bit of that stuff all the time. I think that's what it keeps getting back to. And I know it's a lot for a lot of people to think about. Like, so I got to focus on my own personal learning. I got to learn, learn for the product. And I have to deliver for the product. And I have to deliver for myself. Yes, you do. And it's a lot. And it's a complex world. Um, and so... I, I don't know. I, I see where the people are going and they do really struggle. I think that too often you do have um, people that really focus on one or the other. And it's probably because of the system that they're put in. Um, you know, 95% of people's behaviors um, come from the system. That's an Edward Deming, you know, thing, right? Like the system causes most, most behaviors and 5% is just the variation within people. 
And so I think that um, the system makes a huge difference. And you could set a system up where you, you need to set a system up where those things are all important. And there isn't the variation of like, depending on who you get as a person to be your manager, you may not invest anything in that person's career. And then people, you know what happens a lot of times to those people? They can't go anywhere else in the marketplace. So they stay and they, they spend 20, 30 years at these organizations and you haven't invested in them. And then like, Somehow, some way, some reorg happens and then they get let go 20, 30 years in and now they don't have any skills in the marketplace. And that's just really a fault of the previous managers that they've had. So um, at least those are things I've seen happen in large organizations. So I don't know, Jeff, have, what's, what's, what's your thoughts on this? This, this reminds me a lot. Um, so th- there was a, a point in time when I was a, a manager for a managed services team and the man- it was small. So I think it was like maybe five people on the team. But um, the nice thing was I had a little bit of autonomy with how we ran that as uh, as, as long as we were profitable. Um, pretty much it was hands off or I had all the autonomy to do what I wanted with that team. Anyway, we, we had worked out uh, 10% time for that team. So every Friday at noon, um, the, the team stopped working on billable work and they were free to do whatever they wanted, um, invest in whatever they wanted with that. And I think part of I shouldn't say part of the problem, but part of the um, double-edged sword of of hiring and working with, I just call class A talent, people who just are always motivated to do to do the right thing and have strong integrity, um, good team players, is I, I actually had to step in as a manager and tell them not to work on customer stuff again and again and again. Um, and remind them about the, the investment that they're making in themselves. So, uh, the, the reason I bring it up is, and I completely agree, Jeff, with what you're talking about with the structure, if we could put the right structure in. But even then, you know, it, we, we had that structure, 10% time, Friday afternoons, as, as kind of clear as it could be. But even then, it was still a struggle at times for them to really think about, oh, I really want to, we were so close to wrapping this thing up for the customer. It's only one more hour, two more hours. And I'm like, well, it'll wait till Monday, right? Like it, the, the sky's not going to fall over the weekend while when they don't get their thing. Um, but p- I think a, a good piece of that is just the mindset of the individual. The other interesting thing is uh, Jeff and I talk about this uh, a bit, but not like not everybody understands what a growth plan is. Um, th- they understand what a job is. They understand that they're coming in and maybe structured learning is a thing, but not a lot of people have where they want to be in the future. And I think that's a a pretty powerful place for a manager or whatever we call that person, but just somebody who's focused on growth and helping people understand what it is they should be shooting for and helping that person develop a plan to how to get there. Uh, Back to Jim, what you were talking about was uh, there is an overemphasis on delivery. um, And I feel like that, that growth very easily falls to the wayside, especially for individuals who just don't have that ability already built up in them. I think once you establish that, um, and then they see the value of, oh, this is why I should be looking forward with my career and where I want to be going, uh, then they'll, once it's valuable, then they'll um, uh, put put more time and effort into it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I triggered a reaction in a couple of people recently by taking a hard line on this. And um, we got talking about their best people and they said, oh, we have, you know, a handful of people across these teams and they're clearly the best. And I said, they need to take their hands off the keyboards then. They need to stop coding. And a room full of engineering leads were like, what are you talking about? Why would we take our best people off the keyboard? And I said, because when you're that good, your job is not to continue to be the best. Your job is to make other people around you better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the Phoenix Project, the, you know, one of the, the very popular books about DevOps and, and how work gets done, talks about this a lot. And there's a character in there, Brent. And I don't know if you guys have read it, but yep. I, I've encountered yep. a number of Brents in my career. I used to manage a Brent. Uh, I used to call him the Kraken. And whenever we would have a crazy <laughs> customer problem, I would be like, send in the Kraken. And it was <laughs> the ambulance that we would we would, we would would roll. And it was when I worked at a managed service provider. So I want to talk to you more, Jeff, about your, you know, 
our time in the trenches on managed services. But um, so that was one thing I, I uh, one comment as you were talking that uh, led me to think about Brent and the Phoenix project. But when we did the liberating structure about empathy mapping, uh, it was really eye-opening to a number of people about creating empathy for somebody who is driven only on on delivery. So if if somebody's measured on their on delivery, um, and then we're expecting them to do other things, uh, having empathy for the, the the system they find themselves in, and, and just many people's behavior can be traced back to not what they truly want to do, but the system they find themselves in. And that's what I found very eye-opening about the, the, the less class was thinking about everything as a system, systems thinking, organizational design, um, and what would lead to the behaviors that we want, what would, what would harm the behaviors we want, what would lead us to the outcomes that we wanna see. Uh, and I think anytime you can get people to kind of step back a little bit and look at the system as a whole, they're going to make better decisions. That I, I feel like that's been a common thread in the past four or five episodes now that somebody somebody who's been to the the, the class brings up just just how great and impactful it was from, from what you, exactly we're saying, like recognizing there's a system, seeing the whole system and seeing it over space and time. Um, I, Man, just worth its weight in gold for me. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but um, yeah, uh, it, it was an excellent class for me. Yeah. It's funny when you hear certain people say certain words, like you were just talking about there, Jim. Like, we, I knew you had been to the Lust course, but like, I was on a call on Friday with somebody and they said, um, yeah, I mean, anytime you're focusing on a local optimization, not looking at the whole system, like, it's a secondary concern. Like it's not even that big of a deal. And I'm like, Oh, you've been to Larman's class. Haven't you? They're like, Oh yeah. And I'm like, cool. Like, it's like the secret handshake. Like you hear this certain language and you're like, Oh, you've been there. We were yeah. on the same page, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah, I can't say enough good things about that course. It, it really opens a lot of eyes. I think. I don't know if you guys had this experience, but so I was in a room of, I don't know, let's say 25 people and Craig opened the class. And I think in the first hour, he said, if you are here to learn how to quote unquote do less, you're going to be very disappointed. And there was like a, an audible, like <gasps> intake of breath and around the room. And you could look around and see the people who clearly were like, well, yeah, of course, that's why I'm here. I'm here to learn how to implement less. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, two and a half days later, he finally gets to, okay, here's what that might look like. And I actually had somebody come up to me uh, on the first break of the first day and say, you know, they knew my background. They knew what I did for a living. And they're like, this, this class is for you. It is not for me. I was here to be told how to implement less. And they're like, I get that. Uh, this class has value. And I said, give it a chance. Like, don't sell yourself short that you're, that you need to quote unquote install or implement something and, and that there's no value in taking the next few days and learning how to think about problems differently. Yeah. It's a, I don't know if there's a bigger problem to solve than that, right? Like this higher level thinking and how do you solve problems and how do you apply systems thinking? Like it's just, I don't know. I think the approach is, is perfect. A lot of people, like you said, they go into it thinking it's going to be something different, but why wouldn't you want that? Like that, do you want the answer? Or do you want to know how to figure out the answer of many problems in the future? Like I'll take, I'll take the latter, you know? Yeah. It's really thinking about in thinking about in terms of models and systems and being able to step back. It, it comes fairly natural, fairly natural for me, although I do find myself falling in traps, but I, I credit a lot of the fact that even growing up, I played strategy type games. So I was thinking three, four, five levels, uh, or steps further. My, my dad taught me chess at a really young age and I'm still terrible at chess, but if you're only thinking about the current move, like if I do this, I get this. 
you're you're locally optimizing most likely but you have to think about if i do this i get this that might lead to this that might be a good thing that might be a bad thing what could that lead to what you know how could that play out and a lot of times there's value in talking through that as a big group because we all have our biases so when you grab the marker and hand it to somebody else and be like how does this play out in your world that's where I, what i found very um very engaging when I heard how people saw some of these different constructs actually work in their, in their environment and had different experiences than mine. Yeah. I like the very, very similar, but that's one of the reasons I like having people just uh, like a sticky note tactic. The first time we go in and start decomposing down a feature or a product backlog, backlog item or something like that, just like everybody individually decompose it down on sticky right. notes themselves. And then let's all come together with all of these different potential workflows uh, on the board and then figure out how we want to do it just so that nobody gets anchored into that one way of, of solving the problem. And we can start taking a look at different options that we've got. Kind of like what we started off talking about was that optionality, right? leaving our options open until the last responsible moment. Yep. So anyway, on that, I think we're good for just about wrapping this up. But before we do, Jim, is there anything that you would like to plug and how can people get a hold of you? Um, nothing I really want to plug. Um, ask me again in a month and that answer might change. But right now, <laughs> no. Uh, LinkedIn's the best way for me. It's it's kind of become ground zero for my all my business connections. So I'm on LinkedIn. My profile is just James Salmon's. And uh, love to connect with people, get you know, get in there and, and start mixing it up and having good discussions on there. I, I, I have a love-hate relationship with LinkedIn. Uh, it's, it's clearly social media, so that brings positive and negatives. But uh, I love having good discussions that challenge my thinking and uh, hearing what, what's working for other people. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Agile Wire. We are consistently inspecting and adapting ourselves. We would appreciate feedback at feedback at theagilewire.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store. See you next time.